When you work in film and television, how much do you get paid and when? Do I have your attention? Today, we are discussing the codified basic agreement schedules, also known as the CBA, what they are, what they do, and what it means for you. So if you're working in the entertainment industry, CBA schedules may not be at the top of your mind, but they should be. Hello and welcome. I'm SAG AFTRA Executive Vice President Ben Whitehair. Thank you all so much for joining us for another program on YouTube here with SAG AFTRA. We are joined today by American Sign Language Interpreters Maggie Esquiros and Marie Mara, excuse me, Mara Bassani Santa Maria. Today's topic: the schedules of the codified basic agreement. We're going to take a look at the different schedules, examining who and what they cover. To ensure that we give everyone the most up-to-date information on these agreements, we have enlisted SAG-AFTRA National Director Entertainment Contracts, Jessica Johnson. Jessica began working in the SAG-AFTRA res Residuals Claims Department in 2014 before moving to the Theatrical Contracts Department. In 2018, she became a manager in the Entertainment Contracts Department before becoming the National Director. Jessica, thank you so much for being here today. Let's jump in. How much do we get paid? When do we get paid? How do we know? Give us the breakdown. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Ben. I'm going to share my screen and go through some slides so we can talk about all of those things um, that you so rightly said uh, everyone should know about. So as you mentioned, we're going to mostly talk about the CBA today. And the CBA stands for Codified Basic Agreement. Um, the CBA is the agreement that sets the minimum terms, working conditions, rates, all of that for uh, film, theatrical film projects, and scripted dramatic television and new media programs. It is a little tricky because it's really more than one document. Um, so right now, if you wanted to look at the entirety of the theatrical and television agreements, you would look for four things on the sag After website. All of these can be found at um, the production center at SAGAFTRA.org. Um, first, you have the 2014 Codified Basic Agreement. That's the really long one. It's like 800 pages. That's the big one. That's the one we're going to talk about the most today. Then you have the 2014 Television Agreement. It's a little shorter, but still has a lot of information in it. Then there's two additional documents, the 2017 TV Theatrical Memorandum of Agreement, or MOA, and the 2020 Memorandum of Agreement. So how do all these documents work together? Uh, the television agreement modifies the CBA. So if you're working in a theatrical production, you're going to look at the CBA for your terms there, the codified basic agreement. If you're working on a television or some new media productions, you're going to go to the television agreement, see if what you're looking for is there. And if it's not, it means it's not modified by the television agreement. So you go back to the CBA to find those terms. So you really use both books together for television and new media. Finally, those two memoranda of agreement, the 2017 and 2020 MOA, have modifications to both of those agreements. So when your negotiating team went in and negotiated a new agreement in 2017 and 2020, the changes to the 2014 CBA and television agreement were written out in the MOA in both 2017 and 2020. Um, more than likely in the near future, there will be another codified agreement, so you wouldn't need to look at all of those documents. Um, but then when there's changes in the next negotiation cycle after that, there would probably be another MOA that would make updates to that agreement. And so you do look at all of these documents holistically to find the most up-to-date information. So really focusing in on the CBA, that big book, that you know 800 page book, um, it's structured in two parts. The first part is called the general provisions, and then it goes into the schedules, which is what we're going to talk about a lot today. Um, there's a lot of information in both of these parts, but the general provisions, as the name kind of sounds, apply generally. Um, they're things to, that apply to nearly everybody covered by the agreement um, or things that are kind of more gen general terms that don't need to apply to specific performers. Then the schedules are broken down by type of performer, how you're hired, and have specific terms related to that type of hiring. So some examples of things that you might find in the general provisions would be the preference of employment and union security provisions, per diem provisions, the theatrical residuals provisions, television residuals would be in the television agreement. Um, if there's a requirement in the schedules to travel a performer, the general provisions would have the type of travel, you know, coach or business class. Um, there's late pay provisions, the pension and health provisions, safety, obviously safety of everyone on set is very important. That applies to everybody in, in the general provisions the pension and health requirements, 
uh, nudity and simulated sex provision, employment of minors, clip reuse, grievance procedures, and more. These are just some highlights of things that you would find in the general provisions. Then when you go to the schedules, which we're gonna talk about what each, what each of the schedules are today, um, that's where you find things that are more specific to how you were hired. For example, as a daily or weekly performer, or as a singer or a dancer or a stunt performer, um, you'll find the overtime provisions that relate to how you were specifically hired. You'll find whether you're doing any premiums for things like working on sixth or seventh days in a work week or on a holiday. Um, you'll find the meal period provisions and what the violation is if you don't get a meal break at the appropriate time. Um, you'll find the rest period provisions. Most performers will know that as forced calls. Um, you know, do you get a penalty for not getting the appropriate amount of turnaround each night? And you'll find provisions related to payment for fittings, payment for retakes and added scenes, and payment for travel time. So now I'll go into what each of those schedules are, just so you have a better idea of where you may fit. Uh, there is a whole lot of information in each of the schedules, so we could we could talk for hours about the schedules. So we won't go into the specifics today, um, but certainly this will help narrow down where you might look for the terms related to your employment. Um, and as always, you're always welcome to you know reach out to SAG after talk to the business representative assigned to the production that you're working on to get any clarification that you need. So starting from the beginning, the schedules are lettered alphabetically, though you'll see we skip some letters. Um, but we start with Schedule A. Schedule A is for day performers. So this is anyone hired by the day, starting at scale um, all the way up to Schedule F. We'll talk about Schedule F later, but that's where Schedule A caps out. So Schedule A is for all day performers. Schedule B is where we start talking about performers hired by the week or weekly freelance performers. Schedule B is for scale weekly performers all the way up to what we call a schedule break. And the schedule break is $5,150 a week for television, $6,350 for theatrical. So schedule B covers everybody up to that, to that schedule break. Over that schedule break, we go into schedule C, which is also for weekly performers, but it's weekly performers above that 5150 or 6350 break um, up to the schedule F minimums. Again, like I promised earlier, we will get to schedule F in just a moment. Schedules D and E refer to multiple picture performers and term contract performers. Uh, these are really old ways of hiring. Um, these are not, not typical ways of hiring that you see currently. Um, so it's unlikely that you'd be hired under schedules D or E, but certainly if somebody, uh, you know, if an employer is looking to hire you under schedules D and E, reach out to the union and let's talk a little bit more about what that means. All right, Schedule F. I think Schedule F is the schedule that is most commonly known by its name as Schedule F. Um, and Schedule F is for deal contract performers. Um, for theatrical motion pictures, it's anybody guaranteed $65,000 or more. For television and new media series, it's $32,000 per picture or per episode. Um, so if it was like a movie of the week, it would be $32,000 for the movie. Um, if it's an episodic series, it would be $32,000 per episode. There's an additional money break in Schedule F that I think we should mention here, which is $40,000. So in that television, new media world, when you hit $40,000, um, that's where overtime becomes freely negotiable. I don't wanna go too deep into the schedules as I promised we would you know, save all of that for, for a later discussion, um, but Schedule F leaves a lot of terms subject to negotiation between producer and performer. Um, so it's particularly important if you're hired under a Schedule F contract, that you make sure your individual contract has all of the terms uh, that, that you are expecting for your employment. All right, moving on from here, we move into the schedules that are more specialized to different types of performance. So schedules G and J, sorry, I'm going a little bit out of alphabetical order, um, are for singers and dancers. Singers has a G, uh, schedule G part one and a schedule G part two within it. Um, but if you have any questions about working as a singer or a dancer, under the codified basic or television agreement, I would definitely recommend you specifically reach out to the music department at SAG-AFTRA. They are really the experts in those schedules. Similarly, we have schedules H, I, and K. Schedule H, which has a part one, part two, part three, and part four is for performers hired as stunt performers. Um, schedule I is for individuals hired as airplane and helicopter pilots. And schedule K, which has a part one, a part two, and a part three is for stunt coordinators. Again, we have a whole department that specializes in these types of performers. That's our stunt and safety department. And you can reach them at ssd at sagafter.org. And last but certainly not least, we have Schedule X, 
skipped a few letters to get there. Um, but Schedule X has two parts. Schedule X part one is for the West Coast background zones and Schedule X part two is for the East Coast background zones. So if you have any questions about working as a background actor under the codified basic or television agreement, you can definitely reach out to the background actors department at backgroundactorsinfo at sagafter.org. And that's it. It's not quite as intimidating as it seems when you first look at that, you know, uh, many hundred page book. Um, but of course, if you have any questions, you can always check out these agreements at sagafter.org, or you can reach out to the entertainment contracts team at contractsinfo at sagafter.org. That's E-N-T-C-O-N-T-R-A-C-T-S-I-N-F-O at S-A-G-A-F-T-R-A dot O-R-G. And I'll take my slides down now. Super helpful and and perhaps less intimidating, though, though a little bit complex. At the end of the day, all of this is basically like where in our contracts are the provisions that actors care about, right? When do I get paid? How much? When? All that, right? And, and I think one of the things that I realized um, that is sometimes confusing when you first start looking at these things is that one of the ways that sag after works is that we build on the things that we've negotiated, right? We renegotiate contracts and improve, adjust uh, provisions as things move forward. So that's where, Jessica, correct me if I'm wrong here, you know, we start with sort of a foundation and then when new provisions get added, adjusted, changed, improved, that can then sometimes end up in a different document, uh, a different agreement. And so that's where people can go to check on these things. Is that is that a good summary? That is a good summary. And, you know, primarily that other document is going to be one of the memoranda of agreement. Yep. Got it. Got it. Um, can you tell us a little more in detail about the schedule break and the money break? And like, what does that mean? Practically speaking, you know, if I'm a performer and my agent's like, oh yeah, hey, well, we're dealing with the money break and the schedule. And I'm like, oh my God, I don't know what they're talking about. Like, what, what is it that people should understand about schedule breaks and money breaks? Of course. So money and schedule breaks kind of do the same thing, but they appear in slightly different places. Um, the general idea of the structure of the agreement and how money breaks and schedule breaks play into uh, the terms that apply to your employment is as an employer guarantees more money, um, they buy more things. Um, so they buy more services from you. So schedule breaks are literally just the dollar amounts that move you between those different schedules that we talked about. Um, so for weekly performers, you know, we, we talked about a schedule B and a schedule C. The schedule break is that 5150, 6350, uh, you know, for TV and theatrical. Um, so if you're making more than that dollar amount, you move past schedule B into schedule C. So it really just means which schedule do you fall into based on the amount of money you're guaranteed. Money breaks appear in more places. So money breaks appear within the schedules, they appear in the television agreement, and they're same kind of concept, but they just apply to specific terms. So it's really something where if you're paid more than a certain amount of money, something changes. Um, so maybe if you're guaranteed more than a certain amount of money, um, fittings become included in your fee and you don't get a separate fee for fittings. Or there can be a money break for overtime where if you're paid more than a certain amount of money, your overtime is still paid at a set rate. Um, it's, it's capped at a lower number. Um, so money breaks are just uh, guaranteed amounts of money that when you exceed those amounts, the producer has bought something more from you. Got it. Got it. I think that's a that's really helpful. You know, I I <clears throat> know plenty of performers and friends who uh, had good fortune and worked hard and got into some of those higher payments. And then, oh, wow, you know, this this thing on my paycheck is showing up differently or whatever. So uh, I would just invite, you know, anyone. It's really helpful to know when you're going in, especially uh, beforehand, because these are the kinds of things that I think, uh, where, where I hear the most disappointment is when people are surprised by something that maybe they weren't aware of. Oh, I didn't know that with this extra money that changed this other thing here. Um, so again, knowledge, knowledge is power and knowing what that is going in so that you're aware. And if you have questions or concerns that you could work that out with your agent and, uh, you know, be aware of, of what it is that you're agreeing to. So there are no surprises. Uh, Jessica, is there a schedule break for Schedule A? 
There is. It's just uh, it's a little more uh, uh, hidden than, say, the schedule break between B and C, which is, you know, that obvious break there. Um, so the schedule A break is really schedule F. So if you're guaranteed more than $65,000 in total for a theatrical movie um, or more than $32,000 for an episode of TV or a TV movie, um, that's going to move you out of schedule A and into schedule F. Um, again, the schedule F minimums, though, keep in mind, they're an overall guarantee. Um, so it might be $65,000 for a couple of days of work or a couple of weeks of work or some longer period of time. Um, but that would move you out of Schedule A and out of Schedule C, truthfully, um, all the way into Schedule F. Um, so it's just it's a little harder to find, but it is there. Got it. Got it. Um, going the, the opposite end, perhaps in terms of uh, overall budget levels in general, is there anything different that we should be looking at when we're working under one of the low budget agreements? Definitely. If you're working under one of the low budget agreements, you want to look at the agreement, uh, the applicable letter agreement for that project too, like the ultra low budget project agreement um, or the moderate low budget project agreement. Those documents provide further modifications to the CBA and television agreement. Um, so, you know, they will change some of the terms from the CBA or the television agreement in order to more you know, accurately reflect what's appropriate for the budget level that you're working under. Um, so those those promulgated independent uh, low budget agreements kind of sit on top of the CBA and the television agreement um, and make further changes. So you would add another document, um, lots of fun, lots of reading uh, to to make sure that you see the sol- full scope of the terms that you're working under. Got it. So. So when I get the audition on the breakdown and I see that, you know, the film is a modified low budget or ultra low budget, or if I'm not sure, I could ask my agent or manager. Um, and when I know that that's the agreement that the film is using, I can then go check under the specific terms for for that. Exactly, you got it. Um, and I would add, this is not quite related to uh, payment and all of the rest, but I do want our performers to know that in the low budget agreements, so Jessica said they're they're promulgated, right? Which basically means uh, the, it's a different way of negotiating the agreements, if you will, whereas the full budget agreements were uh, negotiating with the AMPTP and doing all of that with the low budget agreements, uh, just sort of a different way that those contracts come into being. What I want performers to know is that uh, members, staff have been working really hard on uh, improving the self-tape provisions there. So I do want performers to know that there are now in the the low budget agreements, uh, I believe a five page limit on uh, what they can require you to do for a self-tape audition. So if you are auditioning for any of the films that are covered under any of the low budget agreements, um, there is that limit to uh, the amount of pages they can require require you to do for a, a self-tape audition. Jessica, anything to add there? No, I think you got it, Ben. Um, it is for first, uh, first round self-tape auditions, um, and you, you had it exactly right, um, five pages maximum uh, for the self-tapes. Awesome. Awesome. If people have questions, Jessica, can you just remind everybody where where to go uh, look? They go, oh my gosh, I just got this audition, or I just booked this project, or I'm, I'm I just want to know so that I can put it on my vision board and know what what it is that I'm that I'm wanting. Can you just remind us where to go to get more initial information, or where to go if we have questions? Of course. So all the documents that we talked about today are available on the production center at sagafter.org. Um, there's different tabs. So if you go into the theatrical or the television tab, um, you'll be able to go find the, the specifics that you're looking for. Um, and if you have any questions, you can always call us. Um, our contact center can help route the call to the appropriate department, or you could email the entertainment contracts department directly. Um, it's ENT, like short for entertainment, contracts with an S, info at sagafter.org. Um, and then we also gave the email addresses for some of those more specialized departments. If you're, for example, a singer, a dancer, a stunt performer, a background actor, um, you could reach out to the department that specializes in that type of uh, performer. For singers and dancers, it's the music department, uh, music at sagafter.org. 
uh, for uh, stunt performers and stunt coordinators. It's the Stunt and Safety Department, SSD at SAGAFTER.org. And of course, for background actors, um, it is the Background Actors Department. Um, and any of those groups will be more than happy to uh, help explain any of the specifics or answer any questions that you have about your, uh, your upcoming job. Amazing. Amazing. Jessica, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today, helping us get a better understanding of where we can find out more about how we get paid, when we get paid, all those, all those things that are very exciting uh, as we continue uh, to work. If you have any questions, again, about the CBAs, our collective bargaining agreement schedules, again, you can email the ENT contracts info at sagaftra.org or the other email addresses that were mentioned for some of those specific categories. As a reminder to everyone watching, this presentation is available as a replay on our YouTube channel, along with a whole library of programs on important and informative topics for our members. On behalf of the whole team here at SAG-AFTRA, I thank you so much for watching and a special thanks to our regular viewers who've been tuning in each week for our educational live streams. If you have ideas for topics you want to see us cover, send us your pitch at pteoe at sagafter.org. And before we go, if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe, subscribe to sag -AFTRA's YouTube channel to get updates on all of the content we are publishing and maybe uh, share this video or another one with someone who would find this information valuable. Thank you everyone so much for tuning in.